When we're in love, we don't always see clearly. Well, those blurred, distorted and very subjective perspectives are at the centre of the exhibition Love Songs, Photography and Intimacy at the Maison Européenne de la Photo here in Paris. The museum's director, Simon Baker, joins us now to discuss curating those intimate visions and more. Simon, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, I believe you had the idea for this exhibition before you arrived here in Paris uh, as director of the MEP in 2018, so the theme must have been playing on your mind. But given the state of the world at the moment, doing an exhibition about love almost seems uh, radically positive. Is this an attempt to go against the current mood? Not uh, not on purpose. Uh, we, as you say, we I had this idea a long time ago, and we had planned to do the show before the the uh, pandemic. And as the the dates all got shuffled around from replanning, it ended up that it was uh, the springtime as the things started to get a little bit better. And I, I'm very happy actually that we have a show that's very positive after everything that people have been through being isolated, being separated often from their loved ones, um, that we have this positive take on on something which is at the same time a really important part of the history of photography. So it's a, it's a let's say, a universal subject, but um, a very serious um, bodies of work. Yeah. Mm. And it seems like a perfect antidote right now indeed. Well, for those who've not yet visited the exhibition, let's get an idea of that show. <laughs> So in this show, we see passion, romance, the fusion of two individuals, but we also see sickness and grief. Uh, Nan Goldin's collection, The Ballad of Sexual Dependency, is an important part of this exhibition, and it shows a darker side of love and infatuation. What do you think Goldin's unique perspective added to the conversation in the 1980s when her photos started to reach a wider audience? Well, Na Nan uh, Goldin was really at the heart of the show. Um, it was a conversation I had with her years ago doing a completely different show. And we were talking about voyeurism. And Nan said to me, not her exact words, but she said something along the lines of, how can I be a voyeur in my own life? And I had this sudden feeling that maybe it was us as vi viewers that, that felt uneasy sometimes at being really in the intimacy of others. And uh, that, in essence, it's a very brave and generous thing for an artist to do, to share with us uh, times that were well, both happy and sad and difficult, as you say, and that really, um, we can't really be voyeurs when the artists have decided and worked on a project, a body of work, a series, a book, um, an installation, they're offering it to us and we're not voyeurs, we're, we're being invited in. And I think that Nan uh, Golden is probably one of the, mo the, the bravest and most um, honest and open people and I think she's probably inspired many 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 photographers subsequently and I think she's at the heart of the show because she's probably one of the most influential artists of the later part of the 20th century. Certainly very generous as you say and certain photos from two different generations struck me in this exhibition as well. That of French author and photographer Hervé Guibert whose portrait Le Fiancé is resplendent in a large format uh, print uh, in the exhibition and the photos of the Chinese artist Lin Zipeng who works under the name of uh, 223. Now these are two men expressing their own vision of same-sex desire but it would be in the case of uh, Hervé Guibert 30 years before many important rights were won for the the LGBTQ plus community here in mm -hmm. France. How do you think visibility, the normalization of images like that has changed or accelerated things in that domain? Well, one of the things about the exhibition is that we tried to be, we tried to deal with diversity in all of these senses, but also to think who may have done things first and at what point they did them. And uh, Hervé Guibert, both in writing, in his sort of auto fictions and in the incredible photographs that, that we have in the, in the collection at the MEP. Um, he is somebody who pushed boundaries and, and, and um, 
showed a kind of, um, or could say a, that a sort of normalization of same-sex desire in a very, very beautiful way. Um, Lin Jipang is from a different context. He's, um, uh, as you say, he's um, um, working, well, he's working now, but he's working in China, which is also a complicated and difficult place to, to, to deal with some of these questions. He's somebody who has an honest, playful, um, very, a very touching way of, which is both funny and sometimes very thought provoking. But he, he, his, his images are, they're kind of pop and they're very, um, very sentimental at the same time. Yeah. Now, another Asian uh, photographer, Nobuyashi Araki's photos also feature in this exhibition, one of the many celebrated Japanese artists that you've introduced to European visitors. In 2020, the work of uh, Mari Katayama was at the MEP. The following year, Daido Moriyama and Shomei Tomatsu's views of Tokyo. You also work uh, closely with Kyoto Graphy mm -hmm. Festival in Japan, curating a selection of Irving Penn's work there this time around. What is it about the Japanese approach to photography which inspires you? Well, maybe without being too sort of orientalist, I think one of the things that's incredible about Iraqi, for example, is that we think of maybe Western people, we think of Japanese people as being incredibly private and incredibly guarded in their um, in sharing intimacy. And whether that's true or not is a, another question that maybe says more about us than about them. But Iraqi certainly in the late 60s, early 70s, was making pictures that were radical for Japan and probably still quite radical today. You know, he photographed his honeymoon in all of its aspects. That's his, you know, uh, making love, um, walking in the park, but also his um, his new wife looking sometimes not very happy. You, you have all of this kind of range of emotions in the, in the project. And then the second project he made when she sadly passed away it is just breathtakingly moving. So you have in Iraqi's work, in the two series in the show, you have the beginning of the romance, the, the, the wonderful joy of the honeymoon, and you have the, the sadness of losing uh, a true love. Um, and I think that range is, it is very, very, uh, very strong. It's very powerful. I think people, um, my, myself included, find it very, very moving. Mm, it certainly has a, a universal appeal. You're right. Now, moving to a more popular format now for us civilians, perhaps. In two, 2013, the Oxford English Dictionary named Selfie its word of the year. Coffee table photo books featuring the form were published and social media accounts around the world abound with self-portraits. Some have taken the spontaneous snap to another level, orchestrating ever more elaborate photos of themselves. Athlete and artist Mathieu Forger is one of them. He stages acrobatic tableaus in which he appears to be weightless. Forger climbs, somersaults and dances to get the perfect shot and his images now feature in private collections and in some advertising campaigns too. Here's how he does it. I took this photo all by myself, just the camera, the tripod, I pressed the button, 10 seconds on the timer, I ran off, and then bam, I got the shot, and it's one of my favorites. So that's a pretty extreme example of a self-portrait, but how do you think that the technology that we all have in our pockets now in the form of a smartphone has affected our self-image? I think there are the, the um, sense of general... Um, familiarity with the photographic image has exploded. Obviously, we're all sharing images on a daily basis on Instagram and WeChat and, and all of these uh, platforms, which means that we're more familiar with looking at photographs of one another. But I do think there's a huge difference between somebody constructing a, a particular kind of image of themselves, whether it's an artist or a, um, a photographer working with a self-portrait, and what, what we all do. So I think there is a there's a an experiential difference between the sort of quick scanning on a, on a device and being immersed or plunged into the work of, a, of an artist. Yeah. There is indeed. Now, uh, coming to your own career now, before you came to the Maison Européenne de la Photo uh, here in Paris, you were uh, the Tate Gallery's first senior curator of photography. I believe they didn't have someone with specific responsibility for photography before you were there in 2009. Why do you think it took so long for the discipline to be considered a prestigious part or a, a part on its own of this uh, of the fine arts landscape? It's a very specific English story, but um, originally the National Collection of Photography was a, an applied art, so it was at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And all that's happened since then is as more and more photography has been more obviously artistic and more artists have been using cameras, it, it just became... Uh, almost ridiculous to not have photography at Tate. So Tate made the decision, it's true, rather late. But I think it's, as with all the great things about Tate, it's in response to what artists do. So as soon as artists start to really be very, very 
interested in photography, it becomes impossible to not include it. And then it was just a question of broadening out as many kinds of photography as possible. And I, when I arrived in 2008, it was kind of hard to imagine, for example, a Don McCullen show, because it seemed like documentary or reportage rather than fine art photography. Actually, it was always great and always going to be great at Tate. And the, the Don McCullen show that um, I worked on there was a huge, huge success. So I think we got from A to B um, uh, relatively, relatively uh, smoothly. Think. And as you say, better late than never. Now, finally, we asked you for a cultural tip and you pointed us in the direction of something for our ears, not our eyes. The latest album from American musician Kurt Vile. What is it about this collection of songs that won you over? Uh, Kurt Vile is one of my favourite musicians uh, ever uh, and I, li I like all of his albums and this is a new one that just came out. It's, um, it's nice, it's, uh, it's, extremely, um, it's extremely kind of calm and I think we all need a bit of calm right now. Very dreamy. Thank you very much for joining us today, My Simon pleasure. Baker. Thank you. You can see the show Love Songs at the Maison Européenne de la Photo until August 21st. And in the meantime, we'll leave you with a track from that album from Kurt Vahl, Watch My Moves. This is Like Exploding Stones. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after it. Well